Good evening and happy Easter. Um, boy, Easter was yesterday and it was uh, one of the strangest holy weeks on record, I think, being uh, apart from the worshiping community for those uh, few days in a row. Uh, but we got through it and spent an Easter much like perhaps that first Easter um, where the disciples uh, were locked behind uh, their doors in, in fear. And, uh, and so many of us were we're also quarantined uh, in our own way. Um, I'm excited to continue on with our reading of Knowing Jesus even after Easter, um, because as if you've tuned in at all to any of these, uh, it talks a bit about how the change that overtook the disciples uh, with the resurrection, that their experience of the crucified and risen Jesus um, taught them something about uh, reorganizing their way of life, uh, in the relationship with others, to live in a way uh, that doesn't create victims, but that comes to the side of victims in their time of need. And that's what knowing Jesus is all about. So continuing on, we're getting closer to the end uh, of the book. Uh, and this is a chapter called The Universal Victim. And uh, we kind of pick up toward the end of that chapter today, after our few days of Holy Week that we've um, had together in worship via the interwebs. This means, of course, that there is present in the group that lives from the forgiving victim, that builds its unity around the self-giving of Jesus, the beginnings of the possibility of a worldwide unity, a unity of all humanity, reconciled with each other and by definition with God. So the internal dynamic of the presence of the self-giving victim is always universal, always reaching further. This is because what is revealed is a dividing line which runs not between groups, or classes of people, but within every human heart. The dividing line reveals whether or not I build my security and unity over against some victim, some excluded other, and thus, and thus depend on a separative, ever smaller sense of identity, or whether I am starting to receive my identity from the victim and erect no barriers against someone else, but find ever more common ground with the rest of humanity. When Vatican II talks of the Church as the universal sacrament of salvation, it is to this that it is referring. There's one further dimension to the presence of the crucified and risen Jesus I would like to bring out, and that is a dimension which cannot be separated from the dimension with which we have just been dealing. At the same time as the crucified and risen Lord is the foundation of the new Israel, so it is his crucified and risen presence that is the basis of the holiness of this new people. What is traditionally called justification by faith is inseparable from the universality of the new community or new society that the victim founds. There is no grace or faith that is not by that very fact immediately related to the new reconciled community. The new Israel is not tacked on to the making of humans holy as an additional extra. Making us holy is identical with making us part of the new Israel of God. Let me try and develop that. You will remember that what has been key throughout this book has been the intelligence of the victim. I have emphasized repeatedly that this involves a prior self-giving out of freedom. So the whole process of Jesus' life was not simply the story of a lynch, but the story of a man who acted in freedom in certain ways, which he knew would lead to his being killed. He did not want to be executed, but he knew he would be. He didn't allow the, that fact to change the way he acted or taught. And in fact, what he taught was the same. He taught people how to act freely, how to not have their lives run by being locked in an unhealthy or resentful way into the life of someone else or the life of the group that formed them. The symbol of this freedom is the ability to turn the other cheek, to go the second mile, and so on. The importance of all that was the recognition that behind all of Jesus' life was a free self-giving that was in no sense masochistic, in no sense contaminated by the violence of human relationships. Rather, it was their antidote. It was this which, you remember, John saw as being the Father's giving of the Son and the Son's obedience to the Father. That is, the free self-giving of Jesus prior to any of the violence he underwent was the divine hallmark of his mission. It was this element of self-giving that was totally gratuitous, 
not part of any human tit-for-tat or relationship of reciprocity. That was the witness to Jesus being God. Now, Jesus illustrated the depths of that free self-giving in his Last Supper. It was in the Last Supper that he gave a mimed definition of himself as a self-giving victim. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. That is how Jesus was present among his disciples. It was that presence that was made alive again at the resurrection, when the crucified and risen Lord was the making alive of the self-giving victim as forgiveness for all victimizers. This means that when people talk about justification by grace through faith, the grace that is in question is the gratuity of the self-giving victim. There is no other grace. It is precisely that element of self-giving which was present in Jesus' life up to and including his death that is what is present to us as grace. Now this has consequences. It means that holiness is our dependence on the forgiveness of the victim. That is to say, our being holy is dependent on the resurrection of the forgiving victim. And this, as we have seen, is exactly the same as the foundation of the new Israel, the beginnings of the new unity of humanity. The gratuity of the justification by grace through faith and the gratuity which is the foundation of the new Israel is exactly the same. This means that justification by grace through faith automatically implies a relationship to the new community of God. Let me try to say the same thing in a slightly different way, since this is a difficult concept to grasp for those of us brought up in an individualist society and accustomed to an individualist account of holiness or justification or faith or all three. The new unity of humanity, begun in the new Israel, has only this as its basis. The resurrection has turned our victim into our forgiveness. Such as receive the forgiveness, begin to form a new unity without any victims. This means that what is given in Christ's victim death is a subversion of our old human way of belonging and the possibility of our induction into a new human way of belonging, of being with, without any over against anyone else. This means that justification by faith belongs in the first place to the new community, the group receiving as a given its unity from the forgiving victim. It is exactly this making present of the beginnings of a new reconciled humanity, which is making present of justification by faith in the world. There is therefore no such thing as individual justification by faith. Such a justification would imply a rescue of an individual from an impious world over against which the individual is now good or saved. However, while the individual is still locked into some or other form of over against someone, they are not yet receiving the purely gratuitous victim who has nullified all over against. All justification by faith, that is all faith, is a relational reality, flowing from and tending towards the purely given unity of humanity in the victim. There is no grace that is not universal, that is not constantly creating and recreating the purely given unity of all, of all humanity from the body of the victim. Salvation, therefore, as it became present to the disciples at the resurrection, involved from the beginning a recasting of their way of relating to others, such that they were able to receive the purely given without any appropriation to themselves of what was given as if it were somehow theirs. day of resurrection, earth to heaven out abroad, the Passover of gladness, the Passover of God, from death to life eternal, from sin's dominion free, our Christ has brought us over with hymns of victory. 
hearts be purged of evil that we may see aright the Lord and raise eternal of resurrection light and listening to his accents may hear so calm and plain his own all hail and hearing may raise a glad refrain now let the hands be joyful let earth its song begin the round world keep high triumph and all that is therein let all things seen and unseen their notes of gladness blend for Christ the Lord has risen, our joy that has no end. All praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to God the Spirit, eternal three in one. Let all the ransomed number fall down before the throne, and honor, power, and glory ascribe to God alone. Have a good night.